again, Happy New Year to everybody. Welcome to uh, this first Sunday in 2021. And we're so happy to have uh, Pastor Will Yancey to be with us again. He spoke in our Sunday morning services. And Pastor Will is the senior pastor of Impact Church Bay Area and just in San Leandro, neighbors to us. And so we're happy he could be with us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we became friends through a uh, multi-ethnic pastor's fellowship that occurs on Wednesday mornings. And I've really enjoyed to get to, getting to know him and his ministry <coughs> and uh, being able to serve together with him. So uh, before we start, let me open in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, that um, Pastor Will, myself, and everyone who names the name of Christ are your children, and we belong to your family. We are of one blood through Jesus, and we desire to fulfill that prayer, Jesus, you had for us, to be of one heart, one mind, of unity, just as you are with the Father. So we pray that in this time of question and answer, that it will be a time of growing and encouragement and challenge. And we pray that you be with Pastor Will as he uh, shares um, answers to the questions that we will be posing to him. And again, this, through this, you will be glorified and we will be edified. And so we thank you for this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Right. So again, please uh, feel free to enter questions through the chat and I'll attempt to relay them to Pastor Will. And... Um, we're going to start off with a very serious question. So, Pastor Will, what is your go-to place for Chinese food and soul food? <laughs> well, well, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Steve, for having me. And I uh, just want to say hi to the uh, Bay Area Chinese Bible Church family. It's a pleasure to be here and to have uh, shared a word of encouragement to you. And uh, my favorite go-to place, well... I'll tell you in all honesty, my, my favorite go-to place for Chinese food is in Hayward. Uh, it's called uh, Chef's Experience China Bistro. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that restaurant. Uh, we just had some uh, guests over for Christmas and I was sharing with Pastor Steve that on Christmas Eve we ordered Chinese and so that's where we ordered it from. And uh, so our guests are from Nashville, <clears throat> and they said, uh, this must be uh, 24 karat gold, <laughs> the, the food. <laughs> and I think it had to do with the long line that was there for pickup only. Is that right? And uh, mm. it, long line, uh, but that's one of my favorite places to go to. It's a, and when you say go to, that, make, that means convenient for the most part, right? <laughs> But then my go-to for soul food is not as convenient. Mm. In fact, it's a place called uh, Shea Soul in Fairfield, California. Oh. Shea mm. Soul. And uh, the owners are some friends of ours. Okay. And the food is the best. I mean, mm. soul food. And they have a pretty vast menu of soul food from like red beans and rice and collard <laughs> greens and... Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, barbecue and fried chicken and the like. So uh, whenever I can, I'll uh, ride out to Fairfield <laughs> and I'll, uh, my wife and I will enjoy a meal there and then we'll take some home and kind of put it in the freezer. And so when we want that experience again, we don't have to go all the way to Fairfield for the most part. But those are my two go-to places. Okay. Well, and this um, Zoom is being recorded, so we do have that information available. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Great, great. So, Pastor Will, maybe you, uh, one question was, and you, maybe through this you can tell us more about your, your own church right sure. now. Uh, if you were to start another <laughs> church, would you start a multi-ethnic church? Ah, that's a good question. Um, well, first, yes, I would. I, I'll tell you a little background about uh, Impact Church. Uh, we uh, are very young. We're still a toddler uh, compared to uh, churches in the Bay Area. We are embarking upon four years of a relaunch, four years old. Um, as such, we started with about nine people. Uh, uh, seven of the nine were uh, European. In other words, they were our Caucasian brothers that are still with us, uh, brothers and sisters. 
Uh, and at that time, uh, the African-American makeup of our church, we were the minority <laughs> in, in, in numbers, that is. And so uh, as we've been growing here in the Bay Area, <clears throat> we have more families that have joined. And we're still multi-ethnic. Um, some of the ethnicities include uh, uh, Latino. Uh, uh, we have uh, Asian by way of um, a Filipino. Um, uh, of course, we still have our uh, Caucasian brothers and sisters uh, that, that are there with us and African-American. Uh, and there's some in between, you know, there's some uh, other folks that are biracial that are part of our fellowship as well. And so I've, I've never been uh, in my 23 years of pastoring, I've never uh, been the traditional African-American pastor that only ministers to an African-American congregation. Uh, there's some of the things that I, I don't do. Uh, not because I choose not to, it's just that I can't. For instance, some um, do what we call hoop or they have a very uh, singing experience while they're preaching. And I can't do that. I can only preach the word similarly to how I did here in our morning uh, worship service. So uh, as such, I preach a world, a Christian worldview uh, and uh, I'm hoping that all of our folks can be fed uh, the word of God, regardless of their ethnicity. So to answer the question, yes, I would uh, start a, a multi-ethnic church. I think there's rich value in our cultures. There really is. And I've learned to appreciate the differences and to learn from them. Our differences are minor compared to what we have in common. And so the differences are our language, where we grew up, our customs, our culture. And I love those. I love to look at the ancient cultures of peoples uh, outside of my own. Uh, I think they're rich. I love the colors. I love the music. I love the vibrancy of the stories that people have from their ancestry. And I think we should celebrate that in the church. Amen. I mean, mm -hmm. God is a God of diversity. He loves yes, he diversity is. in his creation. Yes. So it should be reflected in the body of Christ. Absolutely. Too. And yeah. valued and appreciated and mm. in the body of Christ. Not seen as a means by which to divide, mm -hmm. but a means by which to come together and learn and appreciate and value. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, another question, Pastor Will. Yes. Similarly, um, you know, in our One Blood Fellowship on... Wednesdays and then the small groups on Thursday nights, we're trying to find out also practical ways in which to live out that unity in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions is, how has your church partnered with other churches in community projects or engaged in racial reconciliation? How is our church participating with other churches? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what's, what's interesting about this is um, I have been enjoying, first of all, relationship with you, Steve, and others that make up our, our pastors uh, group that have been meeting with regards to One Blood and how we can uh, move forward together. And so mm -hmm. uh, some of the moving forward is in its infancy. Mm -hmm. and, and so in all honesty, uh, this is one of the examples of how we can move forward and what we are doing partnering with other churches. I think this is one of the first partnerships between Impact Church and uh, Bay Area Chinese Bible Church by having me uh, share uh, a word of encouragement by way of my testimony uh, with regards to my life here uh, and, and, and equity and racism, uh, but also the hope that being believers, uh, that we have being believers, excuse me, uh, in Christ. And so one of the things that we uh, are doing now in its infancy is building relationships like this here. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have a relationship with uh, Redwood Chapel, which is a predominantly uh, Caucasian um, uh, church. Uh, Jeff Miller is the pastor there. He and I are friends as well. And we've uh, shared the pulpits uh, over the holidays, um, just before the holidays. Uh, he's assisted in preaching for us, uh, even though it's on Zoom, 
He preached for us on Zoom. I preached for him on Zoom and his congregation as well as such. Uh, we're, we're learning that there are people within our congregations that know each other as well. And so we're hoping that that will continue to, um, that will continue to uh, deepen our relationship. But keep in mind, these are still uh, uh, things that are in their infancy. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to uh, the restrictions being lifted, uh, the restrictions as a result of COVID being lifted so that we can then partner uh, in some significant ways. Now, I'll say this, and Steve and I, we realized this. Uh, Steve and I met years ago, believe it or not, mm -hmm. uh, with the Love East Bay. You may remember Love East Bay, and that's when we would uh, do the charitable things on a day uh, of the year. <laughs> and uh, just so happened that uh, that particular year, I participated and I got on a bus and we headed out to San Leandro Marina to clean up the marina and others of our members were doing other things. And I say, well, I'll go to the marina. And so I signed up for the marina and didn't know that this handsome man next to me also had signed up for the marina. And so Steve and I both, along with a few other folks in the van, we were there picking up trash at the marina and he and I talked and we talked briefly about you know our work in ministry and we discovered that we were both pastors and uh and we didn't know that we would connect in this way which is uh, as substantial as love east bay but i think this gives us an opportunity to grow deeper in relationship as it pertains to our churches and the folks that we pastor as well very good mm -hmm. thank you you're yeah. welcome and as um, Val Ma shared in her testimony, um, 15, 16 churches had different members of the church uh, attend interchurch uh, small groups. And uh, we'll be discussing Wednesday if we want to, we may have another round of that. So that may be another mm -hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Um, all right. Okay, Pastor Well, another question. Um, what do you recommend saying to people who are angry and tired of police bias and racism towards African Americans? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I think one of the things I would say to those who are angry uh, as to what's going on with the racial bias, the profiling, um, I would say find others uh, especially believers that you can share uh, your sentiments with. Um, I, I think uh, the Bible tells us in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. And so rather than being an island to yourself, if you will, and, and feeling this way, and, uh, and nowadays, Pastor Steve, people are on Facebook, they're on social media, mm -hmm. and they're ranting and raving and, and and I'm not saying that what they have to say is not significant. I just believe that if we can come together in some way to have a united voice, then there are more people that are like-minded and have more, a, come from a position of a power in numbers, for lack of better terms. Uh, that way you have an opportunity to begin to brainstorm as to what can be done. Uh, of course, you know, some of the higher level things to do is to vote appropriately, uh, not only for uh, in, in the federal races, but also in our uh, local races, uh, state and uh, city uh, and county government. Um, so becoming aware of candidates, becoming aware of how your city or county operates and who makes decisions with regards to that. Um, I think also uh, becoming aware of uh, your police agencies uh, with the, in, within the area. There's something that I did here just recently. I was invited to participate in a training that law enforcement uh, officers go through. And there was a handful of clergy that were invited to participate. And we had to suit up, you know, and have the, the gun. The guns weren't loaded, uh, but we had the tasers and, 
and other things. And there were scenarios that we were like thrust into. And I remember one of the scenarios was uh, me and my partner, we got out of the police car on a, on a regular traffic stop. And the guy got out of the car and started shooting at us with a shotgun. We didn't anticipate that. Uh, but, um, you know, just finding out a little bit more of, you know, what happens on the law enforcement side as well. I think what that does is it gives us a, uh, a perspective that um, broadens uh, our thinking on this issue. Um, but there needs to be change for sure. And, and I do agree that uh, people are of color are treated inequitably uh, in, um, uh, in the criminal justice system. Um, history has shown us that and current times show us that as well. But I would say gather together, you know, let, let one voice become two or more and three or more and, and, and then see what can happen at that level. I, I hope I answered that uh, question for you. All right, thank you, mm -hmm. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So again, feel free to ask questions uh, through the group chat here and we'll do our best to um, relay them to Pastor Will. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Okay, so uh, Pastor Will, a question has been submitted. What story or stories can you share about counseling or ministering to an African American family who has a child in prison or probation due to drugs? Okay. Well, well that particular question is one that uh, is, is, is filled with different nuances. First, there's a family, and then there's a person incarcerated, then there's a person incarcerated because of drugs. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. each of those have their own dynamics, if you will. Um, so um, we have what's called Triumph Educational Center. We um, provide counseling services for families in crises, which uh, many of you know based on the sermon uh, earlier today. Uh, however, before we started uh, Triumph Educational Center, I was heavily involved in prison ministry uh, in the two churches that I belonged to before pioneering our church. Uh, we uh, participated in uh, ministry to San Quentin, uh, to um, uh, Contra Costa Juvenile Hall, Alameda County Juvenile Hall, uh, um, Oakland Work Furlough, North County, um, and as such, uh, developed relationships with people who got out of prison. Uh, one was uh, a dear friend of mine. He's uh, gone on to be with the Lord, uh, but he did 13 years in San Quentin prison for murder. Mm -hmm. And he and I were the same age. And he's gone on to be with the Lord, but uh, when he came out, uh, we, we continued in prison ministry. So, so having said that, now as a person who as counseling services for families in crises. What I would say to a family that's impacted by a, a, a juvenile that's in jail or prison for drugs, uh, first of all, I would say that the family itself uh, needs to have some um, family counseling uh, or at least a session or two to determine where you need the support. And you do need support. Support comes in a few ways. One way, it's in gaining insight as to what's involved with uh, drug abuse, what's involved with prison life, if the person is in prison long term, uh, and, and how to manage and navigate uh, your emotions uh, uh, around that. Uh, so that's one of the things that uh, families need uh, by way of support. Another thing that families need by way of support is the ability to express how they feel without being judged. And it's very difficult for husbands and wives uh, and families to do that with one another because sometimes they begin to blame each other for the outcome of the child. So it's very important to have a place where you can um, um, De uh, debrief for lack of better terms. I, I don't want to use the term vent because venting I don't think is healthy. I think venting just mm. keeps things going and, and, mm. and it gives you an, a voice for anger that uh, can be uh, problematic. So, but, but if you have an opportunity to share your heart 
and then have someone to, uh, you, you can unpack your heart and then have someone package it in a way that affirms how you feel, but also gives you some constructive ways of managing those emotions uh, and then um, um, setting boundaries, uh, being actively engaged in communication with one another, if it's a husband, wife, or family. Uh, those, those are uh, priceless. So the family can utilize that kind of help, active listening with one another, just being able to process this together because it's traumatic for a family to have a child uh, that's in juvenile hall or prison for drugs uh, or, or even a, an older adult uh, that's in prison for drugs. In fact, uh, that's one of the questions that's asked on what's called the Adverse Childhood Experience Questionnaire. Some of you may know it as ACE. And that's back in the 90s where Kaiser Permanente and the Center for Disease Control uh, provided a survey to people to determine their propensities or their inclinations for unhealthy behaviors. Mm -hmm. And one of those, one of the 10 questions they asked was, was there a, a family member incarcerated in the home? And if there was, then the chances of the, that trauma impacting the family was high as well as other questions that they asked. So the family needs support in that regard. Uh, as far as the, the person that's in prison or jail, I don't know if it's a teenager, I think you said a teenager or a child. child. Uh, uh, children? Ch child. A, a child, okay, yeah. so the child that's in juvenile hall, we'll say that, uh, they need support too. However, um, in some cases, it may not be able to come from the family member. Sometimes mm -hmm. a a child is wayward, like the prodigal son uh, in, in the Bible. They just left the home, don't want to talk to mom or dad. Uh, and if that be the case, this is where uh, ministries come in handy, like juvenile home ministries. I mentioned that we were a part of uh, other types of ministries where uh, laborers go into the juvenile hall to share messages of hope. Uh, and. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say about that is, if there is contact with the, uh, with the child, and the child is willing to have contact with the parents and listen, then I would always say, try to in, encourage the child to live a day at a time. In other words, to make it through the day, to do the right things through the day, and, and hopefully uh, they can begin to do some things that, uh, and, Maybe they'll get out, I'm, I'm not sure of the circumstances, but at least support that child uh, through daily living rather than looking at the long term. Well, when you get out, then you'll do this. And when you get out, then we'll do that. So whenever you get out, see, if you focus on that, then you might miss uh, opportunities to minister in the day to day because it's no picnic in juvenile hall. And so you wanna be able to support during the day to day. Very good. Speak from experience. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Great. So I have another question here. Sure. Um, we learned a lot, the, the person asking the question, we learned a lot about our African-American brothers and sisters' struggles through the One Blood small groups. Yes. Um, what They're asking you, Pastor Will, what did you learn about Asian-Americans in these groups? Is there anything Asian-Americans to do to enhance dialogue with believers of other races? Wow, what a great question. I have learned some things and I'm still learning. Uh, so some of what I'm learning, I've not concluded yet because mm -hmm. I'm still a continuing relationship. Uh, Val Ma was one of the uh, persons in our group of Asian descent. I'm learning from Pastor Steve here. Uh, and so uh, to, to answer the question uh, with some, some conclusive uh, mm -hmm. items that I've learned. I've learned that for the most part uh, within the Asian American community or within the Asian community, there, there seems to be uh, um, a, how can I say it? You, you seem to um, kind of wait in the wings, if you will, mm -hmm. as far as conversation is concerned with regards to uh, this, this issue of ethnicity. And I'm learning that uh, that may be cultural mm -hmm. in that 
uh, you're waiting in some cases to be asked a question rather than leading with, hey, you know, this is what we think or this is what I thought. <laughs> I, I think that may be the case. I'm not totally sure. Uh, having some uh, recap meetings with the people from our church that participated in the One Blood experience, uh, they were saying that they would have loved more participation from the Asian members that were in their group so that they can learn more. And it seems as though uh, the Asian members in that group, they, it seems as though they were uh, not as verbal uh, in the experience. And I think that's one of the things that uh, I'm learning, don't know, I'm still, I haven't drawn a conclusion, if you will, but I know that that is one of the issues that was raised in a few uh, sessions that I've had with our people that have been attending. Uh, but another thing I've, I've learned, and I learned this yesterday, uh, um, that, uh, and, and forgive me, it's the uh, person that leads the uh, prayer and his brother interpreted for me, and forgive me, I can't remember his name, uh, I know Edward, Edward interpreted for me. Yes. And his the, brother Johnny? Yeah, Johnny, Johnny, yes. Johnny. Yes. I, I was so thankful for Johnny. He was sharing some of uh, some insights with me with regards to him being a first in some ways as well. And he was the first uh, Asian bookkeeper or, or for a particular organization. And, and, and then I, it began to click with me how some of the things that have happened to us as African Americans have happened to Asians also in different ways, different terminology, same type of racism. We were mm -hmm. talking about not being promoted and, and he was sharing some, some thoughts about that and some life experience with him in that regard. And, and so one of the things that I am learning is we have a lot in common with regards to the racism that we've experienced here in this country. Uh, and so I'm learning that too. It's just, it just doesn't seem as though uh, the Asian uh, community is as verbal about it, maybe. And, and that's not a good or a bad or a right or wrong. It just seems to be um, that that's what I'm learning. So the last thing I'll say about that is I'm also learning how I can be of support and encouragement and maybe even uh, um, uh, challenging to some degree to my Asian brothers and sisters if you even feel that there's a need to uh, get involved. I heard the first question was how do you manage the anger around mm -hmm. you know uh, around the inequities. Uh, I think in some cases um, maybe and, and, and I stand to be corrected ladies and gentlemen but it may be uh, maybe the Asian community doesn't see the the need to get involved uh, as other, as, as the African American community would, if, if you will. And, and the last thing, I think this is the second last thing I'll say, <laughs> is uh, it seems as though, uh, and, I, and I applaud you for this, it seems as though the Asian community takes care of their own. It seems as though they rally around each other. Now that could be a misnomer on my part, but it seems as though uh, the Asian community does in ways that the African American community may not. And, and we could value from that. We could value from that kind of um, uh, fellowship and um, family ship uh, coming around and supporting one another. Thank you. You're welcome. Those are good observations. <laughs> <laughs> and I would affirm probably <laughs> those that you observe. Okay. You know, I kick myself because I go to the Wednesday morning meetings and I go, I should say something, but I just don't say anything. And um, I remember being in, in actually a public speaking uh, workshop with mm -hmm. another Asian American. And everybody's ask, raising hands, asking questions. And we looked at each other and goes, we're the two Asian guys. We haven't <laughs> asked any questions. And he was a pastor too. Uh huh. Yeah. So I think it's something cultural, okay. you know, respecting others. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's some proverb, and people may get mad at me when I say this proverb, um, don't be the nail that sticks out of the wood, because you know what happens? It gets hammered. Ah, so anyway, okay. that's, I've, I've read that. Mm -hmm. And again, maybe it never taught to us, it was, it was more caught than taught mm -hmm. by parents. Mm -hmm. So um, 
So anyway, those are, those are some affirmations of your observations is in the being quiet. Well, yeah. thank you. I, I, I didn't want to be out on a limb on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very mm -hmm. good, very mm -hmm. good. All right, so any other questions? Um, oh, I made a joke, okay. <laughs> Pastor Will, maybe yeah. tell us a little bit about your um, musical experience. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't get asked that often, <laughs> but, but hey, I, I will. Uh, so when I was um, about uh, 12 years old, uh, my brother had a birthday party. I'm going to tell you the long story, but I'll make it short as I can. Uh, and um, he received a, a guitar for a, a, a birthday present from a neighbor, and it was one of those small, you know, folk or classical guitars. And uh, my mom loved music at the time, and she listened to lots of music. And I don't know if there's, if there's people uh, on the Zoom call about my age, but that, that was during the time that we had these eight-foot stereos in our home. I don't know if anybody remember those, but they, were, yeah. they served as a bar and <laughs> had the speakers and the turntable and all of that. And so uh, I would listen to music on that, and I, uh, my brother never played the guitar that he got for a present. And I, I picked it up, and I tuned it the best I could, and I started playing this song that my mother listened to. It was a blues song, um, and uh, I kind of picked out the beginning solo, and, and I played it. And I felt pretty good, but I was learning. And I said, oh, I, I got to learn how to do this, and I learned. Uh, so, I, so I played the solo for my mom, and she was amazed, and she called my uncle, who was a guitar player that I didn't know. I didn't know my uncle much, and, um, and I played it to him over the phone, you know, and this was way before iPhones, ladies and gentlemen. This is when you had the big phone with the coily mm -hmm. cord around it, you know, and you had the rotary dialer and that, <laughs> and I played the song to my uncle over the phone. Um, the end of that week, he had an electric guitar and amplifier under my <laughs> bed for me as a present. So I started playing uh, guitar. Uh, didn't, um, I was in junior high school. In high school, I took classical guitar uh, in school. But in all honesty, I learned more by rote than anything else. I learned by ear, and I could tune my guitar. Uh, from that point on, because one of my schools didn't have guitar, they had drums available as a class, so I took drums, and I found out that I was a pretty good drummer. Uh, and then uh, later on, uh, after high school, I kind of gallivanted around before college, and um, there was a, a need for a bass player uh, in Georgia where I traveled to, and up until then, I had been in garage bands playing guitar and drums, and, uh, and the band needed a bass player, so I said, you know, I could play bass because the bands that I were in, we, we would practice for, you know, hour and a half, two hours, then we would take a break, and then we would go back to practicing, but we would be on a different instrument. And so we all learned how to play the different instruments, the same songs, just different instruments. And so I became a multi-instrumentalist uh, in that regard. From there, I, you know, in my early 20s, I started uh, uh, recording uh, in studios here in San Francisco uh, and in Marin County uh, for some, some artists back in the day. Uh, some are still around today, believe it or not. But I started recording um, uh, drums uh, for the most part uh, and programming drum machines in the 80s when those came out and playing bass uh, in the studio as well. Now I play piano uh, for my church. Uh, I'm the worship leader uh, when we are face-to-face uh, -face worship, mm -hmm. I do play piano and sing, which, which has always been a desire of mine. Mm -hmm. All throughout the time I was playing music, I was not walking with the Lord. When I started walking with the Lord, I said, Lord, I want to be able to play piano, and I never could. I never could all throughout my music career. Um, and it took care of me and my family for, for quite some time playing music and painting, which you know of based on my sermon today. But it wasn't until I started walking with the Lord and the Lord began to put songs in my heart that I began to pick them out on the piano 
And before you know it, I started playing songs on the piano that I would play on bass, and I knew the chords. I knew where to go. And, and so uh, I, I'm not classically trained, uh, but I have been able to secure a, a living at one point in time playing music, and I love music as a hobby. I have a recording studio in my garage that I, I, I frequent as often as I can just to continue on playing, and I love to write music. Right. Why? Well, share with Pastor Will, the next time he comes, we're going to invite him to play <laughs> piano and sing and also preach to us. Amen. <laughs> well, since it's on Zoom, I'll say yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so again, please enter any questions you have via the chat, and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Mm -hmm. So Pastor Will, you grew up in the Bay Area. Where did you go? Did you go to uh, junior high, high school in the Bay Area here? I did. And in fact, I grew up in Richmond, California. Mm. Um, went to De Anza High School. Well, mm -hmm. went to yeah. Juan Crespi Junior High. Mm -hmm. um, and then De Anza High School, graduated from De Anza High School, and I did a small little stint at Contra Costa College because I was in Contra Costa County. Mm -hmm. uh, so then just kind of uh, did the music thing and that, and I uh, ended up earning my degrees later on as an adult, you know, as a working family uh, adult, and even a pastor. My last degree I earned while I was still pastoring as well. So. Uh, but yeah, I grew up here in the Bay Area. I love the Bay Area. I think the Bay Area is a, is a wonderful place to live because we're close to uh, the water, we're close to the desert, we're close to the mountains, mm -hmm. we're close to the snow. Uh, so we, we have um, a variety of places uh, where we can go. And uh, as I've been traveling here lately, I've really grown to appreciate SFO, San Jose Airport and Oakland Airport because all of those are very close to us here. Whereas when we travel, there are times we have to uh, drive two, three, four hours to an airport. So mm -hmm. I love the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, question about your personal testimony. Yes. What were the circumstances that led you to become a Christ follower? Ah, what were the circumstances? Oh, that's a long one. Uh, but I'll be as brief as I can. Um, I received Jesus Christ uh, around that same time my brother received that guitar as a present. I was around 12 years old. Uh, and I received Jesus Christ at a good news club. How mm -hmm. many of you remember that? Yes. Mm hmm yeah, you might remember that. My, my folks on Zoom, usually when I'm preaching, they'll wave their hand. I remember, Pastor Will, I remember. <laughs> so um, we were um, not raised in church, but my mom had us to go down to the Richmond Rescue Mission. And at the Richmond Rescue Mission, there was a teacher, uh, Marion Eastman, who taught Child Evangelism Fellowship. Some of you might remember that. And I received Jesus Christ. Uh, as my Lord and Savior um, as a kid. But mm -hmm. as I grew up, there was no church. I didn't go to church. I just knew that Christ died for my sins, right? Why? Mm -hmm. Because the Bible told me so. And uh, I didn't understand a walk with God. I didn't understand, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. You know, I didn't understand any of those things. So I went out and got involved as a musician. And one of the things that musicians uh, can do is get involved in drugs, and I did. Mm. I got in drugs. I had two addictions, uh, in, in all honesty. One was pornography, and the other was crank. Uh, it was mm. smoking methamphetamine. They call it methamphetamine now. And I lost everything mm. based on those addictions. And it was in uh, 90, oh, excuse me, 1985 that I, I had an apartment, but I, was, I had been evicted. I had a car uh, in the shop, couldn't, e couldn't even raise the $500 mm. to, to get it out. Uh, I had lost everything uh, in the trust of many people as well. 
And it was then that I remember I went to my mother's house. She still lived in California at the time. And I just wept. I just wept because it seems to me that I made a mess of my life. And I wept and I cried and I cried. And, and I couldn't stop crying. This is the thing, I, mm. I couldn't stop crying. So mm. I went into my mother's closet and I got a roll of toilet tissue and I set it on the table and I would just cry <laughs> and wipe my eyes mm. and cry and wipe my eyes. And my brother, I have two brothers and one sister and I'm the oldest. And one of my brothers came in and I tried to stop crying and I couldn't. Mm. And he saw me crying and he made some funny joke and then he laughed and I was just crying. It, it, it seemed as though I had squandered my life away. Mm -hmm. It did, and I mm -hmm. was so disappointed in me. I was disappointed in the choices that I had made, mm -hmm. and I was thoroughly disappointed in where I had fallen because I, I wasn't doing music. I mean, I had just fallen to this place. And my mom came home and she said, you know, there's this church uh, down there in Richmond uh, and the pastor's about your age, maybe you should go. And that's all she said. And I was willing, I, w I was open to anything at that point. Mm -hmm. And I, I went to that church that following Sunday, and I only had two pairs of clothes by that time, the clothes on my back and the clothes that were at my mother's house. And I lost everything. And I went to that church, and the, the pastor, he was preaching the gospel. He he said, Christ died for our sins. He says, God loves you. Mm -hmm. And he separates your sin as far as east is from west. And he says, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He said, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And as mm -hmm. I began to hear this, it reminded me of the child evangelism fellowship stories mm -hmm. that I heard about Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and I just felt this sense that I was, that, that God was watching me and he had never left me, but I needed to repent. I needed to say, I'm sorry. And I said, Lord, mm. forgive me for everything I've ever done. Mm. Please forgive me for not knowing what to do. Forgive me for the decisions that I made. And you know, I went to that altar and I asked the Lord to forgive me. And I asked, I wanted to receive Christ. I didn't know, you know, at that time I didn't know. So you don't have to receive him over and over and over, right? But I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to make sure I was okay. And so I did. I went up to that altar and I asked Jesus to forgive me and to cleanse me. And he did. And I felt immediately it, it was as if the weight of the world had been lifted off my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And the next Sunday I went back to that church and I was the first one at the altar again. I just wanted to keep going, right? I just wanted to make sure I was okay. But I found out that I didn't have to keep going, but I do have to grow and I have to learn. And I found out the importance of scripture and the importance of reading scripture and obeying scripture and learning scripture and memorizing scripture. And before you know it, my pastor who was my uh, scripture partner, I, I would just call him and he would say, well, you have your Bible? And I'd go to my Bible and he'd answer the question with the Bible. He'd allow the scriptures to answer the question. And I got used to that. And I said, wow. And I was so hungry that he said, you know what? I think you need to go to Bible college. Mm -hmm. And I knew nothing about Bible college. I, kn I didn't even know that was like the way pastors <laughs> were, were, were trained for the mm -hmm. most part. And he said, yeah, you need to go to Bible college. And I said, okay. And so, and this is another thing Steve and I have in common. Uh, so my first uh, college experience was uh, at a Golden State School of Theology. That's where I went. And I learned, and, and I learned in a very focused, concentrated way, right, the, the scriptures. And from that point on, God began to tug on my heart, or uh, he began to show me people uh, that really needed the Lord. And over time, I became a pastor, but that was where it started. It started at Golden State School of Theology. And so I gave my life to the Lord. I said, Lord, whatever you want. And, and the last thing I'll say about that is when I rededicated my life to the Lord at that church, I put all of my instruments in a closet. In fact, some of them got stolen from me because I kept them at a place that was, you know, a lot of people came to. 
and I never wanted to play again in my life. Mm -hmm. I said, I never want to play again. All I want is the Bible. All I want is the Word of God in my relationship with Him. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And you know, I'm, I'm thankful for a pastor that really knew the Word because he found out I was a musician and he says, uh, Brother Will, would you play the guitar in our worship team? And I said, oh, no, I'm a new creation in Christ. I don't do that anymore. Right? <laughs> I don't play music anymore. And he said, and he heard me the first time, and he didn't say anything the first time, but he asked me again the following week. And I said the same thing. I said, that was the old me. I don't play anymore. I don't do this, those things anymore. And he says, well, that music was a gift from God based on your story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And see, so now you can use that to the glory of God rather than the things you used to do and the people you used to play for. Mm. And when he explained that to me, then I said, oh, does that mean I can play again? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yes, you can. So then I began to play again. Wow, what a powerful story. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the prodigal son or the apostle Paul, God forgives us of our sins he redeems yes. us and he uses us for his glory yes he does so that's a powerful sh sharing thank you so much for amen that. you're mm -hmm. welcome <laughs> all right um any questions from you folks otherwise we're we're getting close to uh 2 15 and uh welcome any questions that you might have or pastor wills or anything else you'd like to share with us about again um biblical reconciliation that you think we personally can be involved in? Yeah. Yes, I, I think um, one of the things that we can all do that moves the needle toward reconciliation is to have substantial conversations with people that are different from us. Of course, we know the one blood um, uh, small group experience help people to do that in, in a group way. Um, and if, you're, if it's safer in a group, join a group or maybe even if we do this again maybe mm -hmm. the one blood experience would be a great experience for you but also on an individual level to to begin to learn from others that are not like you and ask questions hey you know where'd you grow up you know what mm -hmm. what is your life like what is your uh, what is your involvement with law enforcement you know what are your views on law enforcement without becoming political just become personal and that you're learning about each other. I, you know, since um, meeting uh, both you, Steve, uh, also uh, Ben Chung, mm -hmm. excuse me, I'm wanting to know so much more now about the Asian community than I ever have wanted to know. Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful. Believe it or not, Steve has lunch for me. Guess what it is? Fried chicken. <laughs> 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 but, but I'm looking forward to learning so much more about my Asian brothers. And, and I want to know, I, I so appreciate the rich customs uh, that I see. I don't know if they're pagan or not. You know, I just, I just like, mm -hmm. I, the, you know, and, and forgive me, I, don't, I hope I'm not being not politically correct mm -hmm. or whatever, but I love the firecrackers uh, mm -hmm. during the, the celebration of New Year's and that. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time I was in Oakland and they lit off some firecrackers and it was just string of them from mm -hmm. the top of a building. And they lit it from the bottom and it went all the way up. And it was, and it was just amazing. And I was parked right in front of this, right? And I said, they are celebrating something. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. I want to learn more. I really do. I want to be engaged. Mm -hmm. And so, see, now I have, a, I have a means by which to do that with Steve here <laughs> in the uh, Bay Area Chinese Bible Church family. Teach me teach me let me learn and i'm willing to share my traditions with you uh my thoughts with you uh you know as being an african-american man uh, my family i have three daughters uh, my wife and i are empty nesters i mean i really do want to learn so much more about the asian and i know that using that term asian it's like very very broad and forgive me for not being specific but i want to learn more about uh, the Asian community, uh, period, so that that will help us move toward reconciliation. See, when you know one another, then it begins to remove those barriers. It does. When you, when you know one another, I, I mentioned in, in my sermon today that there was a, a, a Caucasian man who said, 
you know, Will, you speak well to be a black man. <laughs> and he, and he, he was giving me a compliment based on, you know, what he thought. But one of the things about that is he felt free enough to do that. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it broke down some barriers mm -hmm. and, and that helped he and I to engage in conversation even more. And so when we build relationships with one another, and I mean substantial, not token relationships. I know a black guy or I know an Asian guy. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, hey, I know Steve and, and we're having lunch or, or we're getting together on Zoom or we're, you know, or, or we're spending time uh, in a meeting or whatever. That helps to develop uh, an authentic knowledge of the other person's culture through that person. And that's valuable. Well, I also value getting to know uh, you, you, Brother Will, mm -hmm. and Brother Crawford, and mm -hmm. Steve Nation, and others, mm -hmm. and learning more about African American culture. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it just brings down walls and mm -hmm. things. We have, like I said, much more things in common than we have differences. Mm -hmm. And that will do, and the body of Christ can lead the way by Absolutely. showing the example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, this was a more specific question on this mm -hmm. topic. What if you don't have, what if the majority or maybe all of your friends are one ethnicity. How can you intentionally break out of, the, out of that without seem, making it seem forced? That's a great question. And uh, many of us do have homogenous relationships, mm -hmm. meaning we're all the same. And, mm -hmm. and, and there's a value <laughs> to that, of course, in that you uh, can develop the same mind and same thought about issues, but the danger of that is only seeing things from that same mind and from that same thought. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the ways is to look for groups that may be available um, or look for opportunities, excuse me, that may be available for you to um, learn someone. Uh, for example, let's say for instance, you shop uh, and let me see, how many of you can wave your hands in Zoom, Lane? Let me see your hands. Okay, I see some hands there. How many of you shop at Safeway or Lucky, any of those types of stores? Okay, in those traditional markets, we'll say, uh, there's usually uh, some African-American employees or some uh, Latino employees, somebody that you see regularly, right? And so what you may do is begin to greet them regularly or begin to go to their check stand just mm -hmm. so you can say, hey, you know, how are you? How, how are things going? You know, sometimes uh, I'm there and they'll say, like just the other day I was in Safeway, and, hey, Pastor Will, uh, how's your new year? <laughs> you know, and, and so that may be a way for you to begin a relationship that's not necessarily forced and they're not in your community yet, but you're, you're extending yourself to become uh, engaged with someone else where they may learn more about you, you may learn more about them. And that may be an entry point to uh, learning more about the person or maybe even having coffee somewhere out of Safeway or out of Lucky, right? So, uh, and then there may be other opportunities even at restaurants that you may frequent. You may see somebody of a different ethnicity there pretty regularly. So I would say begin to befriend people if you can in that regard so that uh, it's not forced. Now, you may be forcing yourself to do it, but they don't have <laughs> to know that, right? <laughs> but it, it's not forced, but you're saying, you know, I want to learn more. I want to I wanna put myself out to, to the degree that I can learn people. So that may be an opportunity. There's also like social groups, and I would... I wouldn't say do it on Facebook or one of the social media sites because, you know, that's, you know, all kinds of things happen there. But there may be after after this COVID uh, restrictions, uh, there may be some other groups that you may get involved in. Uh, and we're hoping that we would continue the one blood, if we're going to call it that, the one blood experience. And that would be a great way mm -hmm. to uh, meet people and then continue relationships after that because you met with the intent on uh, moving toward reconciliation. Great suggestions mm -hmm. and um, we can always just simply pray too, right? Lord, lead me Absolutely. to somebody uh, that is different than myself 
yes and build a relationship with them mm -hmm. and i think the one blood small groups if we continue that is great because then it's other believers for sure yes and we have that common ground ready in christ absolutely yeah. mm -hmm. well we're nearing the end of our uh, time with pastor will uh we could probably take one more question if you put it in the chat so we'll wait a few seconds here is it okay if I ask a question? Oh, yeah, please ask a question. I, I don't know if I'm breaking okay. tradition here, but <laughs> for those of you who heard the message today, I'd like to know what resonated with you, if anything. And if there's anything was insightful for you, or mm -hmm. if there's something that resonated with you, if you could put that in the chat, and uh, maybe we could uh, see that. I'm curious to know. Put it in the chat or send an email to us and I'll make sure it gets to Pastor Will. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the other day we were just uh, fellowshipping and he said to me, please feel free to speak, basically speak into my life. There's some things you see that I can improve in or grow in. He's just an open book. And so I reciprocated, but I think that's, uh, that shows, uh, again, his humility and desire to, to grow and learn more about others than, that are not like himself mm -hmm. and just uh, the learner spirit this brother has. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, here's a couple comments. Okay. Uh, remember, they, from the message, we remember to see people from God's perspective, mm. not our own, that we are all ministers of reconciliation. I love the passage you chose to preach on gave me a new understanding of 2 Corinthians 5. Mm. Uh, again, another one, we are, we are given the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're representatives of God's kingdom. Amen. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much for answering that for me. Amen. So um, if there's more, I'll pass them on to you. Sure. Um, <laughs> so thank you for being with us this afternoon. And um, I hope that you were encouraged, you were edified and challenged to this Q&A. Pastor Will, would you close a, uh, in a prayer for us and ask for God's blessing upon us? I'd love to. Ministry. I'd love to. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this time that we have had to gather together as your people to learn more about your love, to learn more about our responsibility to display your love to all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, that you even tell us that people will know we are your disciples for the love that we have for one another. I thank you for the love that I felt since uh, meeting Pastor Steve and even walking into this place here today. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that that love will continue to grow amongst us mm -hmm. because you've given it to us by your Holy Spirit. I pray, Father, that even those that are on the Zoom call are motivated by your love because you were motivated by love mm -hmm. to give your son for us. Yes. Let love be our motivation for love covers a multitude of sin that you would guide each and every one of us in ways that you want to use us to your glory to bring about uh, reconciliation in our immediate communities and of course in our nation, mm -hmm. but we can only focus on our proximity. Mm -hmm. So guide us by your spirit, Lord. Help us to cultivate those relationships we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord, to, to pray for others that are not like us. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord, to uh, see people from your perspective and thus engage with them mm. the way you determine we are to engage. Mm. Father, I pray that you would remove all fear that we have of other people, mm. uh, in part the media and other, other uh, entities uh, uh, kind of institute that. Perfect love casts out all fear. Yes. Let us love as you have loved us, let us love others. Mm. And I thank you for this group. Let them receive what you have. Uh, let it be planted in their hearts mm. and let it bring forth fruit in their lives. In mm. Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, thank you again, Pastor Will. You're thank welcome. you all for joining us. Have a great New Year, first week of the new year. <laughs>